so you're a true pioneer of craft brewery in this area. Um, how did you get started? I know your wife helped you out a lot. I started home brewing in 1995. Um, it was my first year out of high school. I was in college, mm-hmm. and uh, on a fake ID, I was you know <laughs> buying a lot of beer, and I've always liked better beer, even in high school. It was one of those things that I. When everybody was bringing, you know, a suitcase of Natty Light to the party, I was the guy who was bringing in Sierra Nevada nice. um, and Sam Adams, stuff like that. I really enjoyed bigger, bolder beers. Um, when I went off to the first college, I went to into Radford. Um, I was still like in party mode. I didn't really pay attention in school. That's one thing I regret. It's not sticking to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, there's this beer and wine shop over in Virginia Tech over in Blacksburg that's where my wife went to school um, it was called the Vintage Cellar and I remember going in there and I kept every week I would drive over there and I'd buy all this great beer mm-hmm. finally the manager uh, sat there and said you know you come in here all the time you know why don't you uh, have you ever thought about making your own beer and I was like no so next thing you know I'm cooking beer up on a hot plate in my dorm room and I just got thrown out of school for it um but fast forward, I went after that summer, when that next summer came, my dad had a small business around here, and I used to work for him all the time, but he kind of, I sat there, and he's like, are you ready to come back to work? And I said, um, no, I, I, he's like, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, I, I want to open a brewery one day, and he mm-hmm. thought I was just you know, a young college kid drinking too much. And I said, no, I, I think this is really something that's cool, you know, I think this is something you can do. And at that time, I was, you know, trying to figure out, you know, looking at it, and I think this is right when the internet was getting started and stuff like that. So, I mean, as much information I could find about it, right. uh, magazines and things like that, I, I looked it up. And I, the funny thing is, is there happened to be a brewery that opened up over on 24th Street, right. Steamship. Right. It's totally worth and my it. dad did a lot of work with the Chamber of Commerce. So, he's like, well, let me call this guy. He might be able to help you out. And long story short, I worked that summer uh, at a brewery, mm-hmm. and I loved it. Uh, what we do is not glamorous, and that's the thing. Is you know when I when when people come to me, hey, I want to open up a brewery. The first question I ask is, have you ever worked in a brewery? Right. Um, and when they say no, I'm like, you need to go and intern at a brewery. Right. Um, because if you can do it, and I did it two t- two times. I did it with Steamship, and I did it with um, St. George over in Hampton. If you can work there for free over a, a, over a good amount of period of time, six months or more. And you still want to do it? Then hats off, and then that this is the business for you. Because right. there's a lot of people that come in here and they'll intern with us, and then three or four days into it, they're just like, "I got, I can't do this anymore." <laughs> I, or they'll be nice and say, "Hey, we'll, we'll, I maybe maybe just a couple of days a week," and you just you realize then they're that not passionate you know, about it. Yeah. Um, so after that, I. You know, didn't do so well in Radford, so I ended up going to ODU, coming, moving home, going to ODU. Um, kept home brewing. Um, next thing you know, you, you get closer to graduation, and your your mind starts moving. You know, I started dating her, and next thing you know, your mind starts moving like I have to get a real job. <laughs> right, know? right. So once you start getting the real jobs, I just didn't want to do it. Even she'll vouch for me on that. It was you know, I I think coming from a family of entrepreneurs, I think. It's a uh, one of those things I can't I can't work for somebody else because I and I'll end up inevitably I end up picking apart what they're doing wrong or what they're doing right and how we can or what they're doing wrong and how we can fix it and things like that and so long story short uh, I went to I was working for Cisco Foods um, selling food and I didn't bleed Cisco blue so I quit mm-hmm. and I went to work for St George. Uh, I interned. How, how long was it? I interned for about six to eight months over there. I think you were there for almost a year, actually. I was there longer than that, but I mean, just for free. Yeah, um, I think the total amount of time was about a year. Okay, she uh, she was working for American Express at mm-hmm. the time, so she's the one who basically said, "You keep talking about this. You keep dreaming about it. You're doodling on little bar naps all the time. Um, why don't you? It's one of those shake it off the pot moments. You know, you, what are you gonna do? Mm-hmm. So." Luckily, she was the the main force behind me, just saying, "Do it, do it." And next thing you know, I'm at working at St. George, and the next thing you know, it's building my business plan. Um, 
I try to buy St. George, that didn't work out. So the next thing you know, I'm doing this. All right. Uh, and then the recession hit, and we lost a lot of the investment money. But mm. then we just kept saying, you know, we're going to do it anyway. Right. You know, so we did this on a bootstrap. I mean, relatively, watching some of my friends start up breweries in the multi-million dollar range, we started for a, a mere percentage of what they started with. And it's it's crazy how far we've gotten very undercapitalized. Mm-hmm. Uh, going forward, if I was going to do it again, well, we are doing it again because we're building a new brewery. I know, I've just seen it. Um, yeah, we are definitely going to overcapitalize ourselves on this one. Um, the great thing is, is we already have a proven product. Um, out, markets outside of here want us, so it's it's now our goal to grow right. uh, even more so than what we can do here. This was supposed to be for us. This building, we figured five, seven years, we'd be still here. Uh, we're coming up on our fourth year, and we we can't even walk through there. We're it's so packed with stuff in there. So exactly. That's a good deal. But, yeah, so that's uh that's it in a nutshell how I got into this business. Gotcha, gotcha. That's great, that's great. Um you indicated some of your challenges, uh mm-hmm. not starting with uh, enough capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your challenges moving forward? Uh the unknown, I think. Um I think right now our biggest challenge why well, I just wrote challenges down. I was sending a letter out. Um, I think our biggest challenge right now is is in this current facility is we can't keep up. Mm. The challenge going ahead is 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 the is what we're doing basically is starting another business. Mm. So all the hiccups of build out and all the hiccups of the new the equipment coming in. We're spending a lot of money this time around, and, mm. and I'm right back, and, and I'm all nervous. I, I don't sleep again at night. I'm anxiety because I'm not sure what's going to happen. I felt the exact same way three and a half years ago doing this, but then it all seemed to take care of itself. Yeah. So I just kind of have to have some faith and some hope that going into this new building is the right step. I firmly believe it's the right step, but if you're not a little bit nervous, <laughs> you're not doing it right, or, or something is going to blow up in your face and you're going to get taken by, you know, so I think that's our biggest challenge right now. I don't think it's all the other breweries that have opened up. I don't think it's the industry at a whole, as a whole. Part of it's the industry that makes me nervous. Is I do think we're in a bubble. Right. I don't think it's going to speak about that too. Yeah, I don't think it's going to pop. I think it's going to let the air out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I was going to speak on that too later on. Um, because you got a lot of different breweries popping up left yeah. and right. Um, uh, I read an uh, article today actually on in Times Magazine, um, uh, talking about that fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, about all these breweries, but um, they indicated that it's still a high ceiling, uh, but you just never know, depending on the area. Um, it gets to a point, okay, there's there's finite tap handle space, there's finite exactly. shelf space. Exactly. Um, the only thing that we're doing right now is chipping, slowly chipping away from the Miller, Coors, Bud Light, mm-hmm. that, that, those portfolios. Mainstream. Um, the problem is, it's not really a problem, I mean, we're so behind the times here in Hampton Roads, coast of Virginia, whatever they're calling it now. Um, we're so behind the times comparatively to like even Richmond and Colorado on this this beer thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the sad thing is, is the guys on the West Coast who have started 20 years ago are bringing their brands into our state, and and they're coming in with more marketing money, mm-hmm. more power behind them. Just like we saw with the Budweisers and the course stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The, the the other thing is is that I see what's going to happen is a lot of consolidation over the next five, ten years. Not just with the breweries, but with the distributors also. We went from having 800, like about, uh, about 10, 5, 10 years ago, there was probably only maybe 1,000 at the most breweries in America. Mm-hmm. Probably even less than that. And there was probably 5,000 distributors. Now there's almost... 4,000 breweries and maybe only 1,500 distributors. So what what I'm seeing, what makes me real nervous is that these distributors, uh, even like our distributor, we were probably like their eighth craft brand. They're they're a Budweiser distributor, Mm -hmm. so they have all those Bud products. But then when InBev and AB, or when InBev bought Anheuser-Busch out, all of a sudden now they're bringing in, they have Stella in their warehouse. They have all these other beers that never were there. Um... And then on top of that, they keep acquiring brands. Right. So they went from having maybe 10 craft beer, American craft beer brands, to now probably about 35. So what sets us apart now inside our own backyard? Right. Not just because of the other guys that are open. I mean, my buddy from Beach Brewing, 
um, he's with a different distributor. So technically, we we are in competition. I mean, all of us are in competition, but there's a lot right. of camaraderie. Right. I mean, he's doing his grand opening this of his new facility this weekend. We're going to go out there and support him. But our distributors and his distributor hate each other, kind of thing. You know, mm. they might have a beer on the side, but when it's come, it's sales now. Right. And um, then you look at. But yeah, now they're starting to bring in these other like New Belgium, Fat Tire, and stuff like that. My my distributor handles them. Well, all of a sudden, because they have the marketing money and because they have uh, the capacity to be like, here's four tractor trailer loads. Uh, we're going to pay to paint your truck fat tire on it. Right. We're going to do this. But in return, we want this many facings on the grocery store shelves. We want this many tap handles in the first four weeks. We now, I think we have the ability to do that once we move out to new markets because we can prove what we've done here locally. Right. But they've been doing it in, you know, damn 20-some states, and now all of a sudden when you come across the Mississippi, you can come over kind of like a tough guy, kind of a, you know, push people out of the way. Right. So I think that's going to be the problem. Um, distributors are consolidating. I'm watching it right here in Virginia. We've had probably about 10 distributors, probably about 10 or 15 distributors, small and big. And now it's really coming down to maybe, I think there's like six distributors in, in Virginia. And people are, are literally looking over who can buy who out. Right. Because that's how they're, at, I mean, especially the Anheuser-Busch guys, they're landlocked. Um, and that's by one of the Bush family members way back in the day. Like, you're going to be our distributor, but this is all you can do. This is the only area you can sell in. Mm -hmm. And they did. And it was smart when Anheuser-Busch was doing it. But now with the influx of craft, these guys, the only way they're going to grow is if they buy the guy next door to them in the next market uh, to build a bigger footprint. Right. Um, the same goes for uh, craft beer. I mean, Boulevard in Kansas City uh, just got bought out by Duvel in Belgium. So um, Blue Point just got, just recently, like two days ago, just got bought out by Hansel Bush. Mm -hmm. um, Goose Island, great beer up there. The thing is, is people like Anheuser Busch and Miller Coors, they they're not going to be able, and they're seeing it. They're not going to be able to uh, fool anybody with Blue Moon and Shock Top. Blue Moon <laughs> is a good beer. Shock Top is a good beer. But the thing is, is everybody knows that Miller Coors makes Blue Moon, and everybody knows exactly. that Anheuser Busch makes Shock Top. Exactly. So what they're going to start doing is they're going to start buying up people like us, because I'm sorry, but Carlo Carlos Brito, the chairman of InBev AB InBev is not going to sit there and spend $58 billion on Anheuser-Busch to see their brands do this. Right. So the way they can combat that, if you can't, you know, if you can't beat them, buy, buy them. them. Right. So, right. And I have a feeling that's what's going to happen in the next five, ten years. I, you know, that's what the Times article was indicating. So, uh. it, it cannot, we cannot have 10, 15,000 breweries in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would literally put, I mean, right now there's 70 in Virginia now. Mm. Literally... When we started our business, we, I think, were like the 10th brewery. So over that much, over three and a half, four years, uh, there's been, well, there's a lot of still in planning, and I'm probably counting those right now, but yeah, it's it's just ridiculous. From little <laughs> nano breweries to Devil's Backbone, people like that. So. Right, almost saturated. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you talked about marketing. Um, your strategy towards marketing is, is, is unique. Uh, how do you set yourself apart? Uh, well, we, you know, we, I think you have to be local oriented first. Right. If you don't take care of your backyard, then you're not going to be able to really do anything um, outside your market um, because the distributor won't trust what you're doing. The way we looked at it was we are coastal Virginia. We are, but I, you know, my wife's from Virginia Beach, but I'm from Norfolk. So I'm more of like the urban city kind of guy. She's beach girl. Uh, I still love the beach. You know, grew up going down to the beach, you know, surfing and things like that. Mm -hmm. We wanted something, and with it being a navy town and things like that, we wanted to be, we wanted to do things that were synonymous with our area, but not so Norfolk and this area alone where people outside this market couldn't understand it. I mean, I I don't know if people know the nautical name of a red buoy is Red Nun, like I do because I grew up on the water, you know, water skiing and fishing and stuff like that. But when they see the buoy, they may you know, that it'll click. And mm -hmm. Green Can's the same way. Norfolk Canyon is the offshore fishing grounds, and that's where you can go out and catch sailfish and tuna and things like that. But a lot of people don't know that there's also a military background for the Norfolk Canyon as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
Great Dismal, which is which is a cool name, but it's also the swamp. It was an intercoastal waterway. It was a, a way to bring logs up. So you can see we're kind of nautical in nature on things like that. Uh, El Guavo, that we just added agave uh, nectar when we were doing the test batch. And we were all joking around, arriba, arriba, and the next thing you know, El Guapo came out of our <laughs> mouth. So uh, going forward, yeah, we'll start mixing up um, ideas. We use a local artist to do all of our... Um, all of our artwork right now. Mm -hmm. So we like to give back and things like that. So it's a little bit different, not as graphic as some of the other people are doing. And I think that's another reason why people like our brands is it, it pops on the shelf and people are like, wow, you know. And then again, we're, we were the only local one for the longest time. So. Right, right, exactly. Um, more marketing. Uh, more marketing is really, we're just going to stay grassroots. Right. I mean, Dogfish and people like in Rogue and Stone... Um, they virtually spend virtually nothing. I mean, obviously they're spending money. I mean, you'll see them in like New Brewer magazines and ad space and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we don't, none of us in the craft beer industry have commercial. Sam Adams obviously being the dip only one. Um, I don't consider Sam Adams craft anymore, but yeah. the Brewer Association apparently does. Um, but it's really all about taste, and you're going to find your loyal fan base, and that loyal fan base will tell somebody else. If you're right. making quality, consistent beer, what's going to end up happening is you're going to enjoy it, and you're going to tell 10 more people. If you have a bad experience, then you'll probably, or actually the other way around, my, my old life in sales, if you have a bad experience, you usually tell more. But, but if you really like something, you're going to tell your friends, and your friends may like it, and next thing you know, it just spreads. So grassroots to us is our true marketing plan. Uh, but as we move into new markets, we'll probably put salespeople out in markets to help keep the word alive that we right are O'Connor. So. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, as you can see, I got a unique last name. I'm from Nigeria. Yeah. Um, the beer there is outstanding. Uh, you can get a beer, 25 for like a dollar. Okay. Um, one of the special beers there is called Star Beer. Okay. Um, have you guys traveled around the world and seen any different type of beers that you need? As much as I've ever been, as far as I've ever been, um, I'm the guy who goes and tries a local beer at any American city. Right. Um, as far as Nigeria, no. I mean, I've, we've been to Europe. You know, nice. I think Italians should just stick with wine. <laughs> I think. Uh, I was going to ask you, you have you had any bad beer experiences? I think Greeks should stick with ouzo and wine. <laughs> I think I think Mykonos beer is the worst beer in the entire world. <laughs> There's no. They shouldn't even bottle. They should just close that place down. Um, the uh, there was a couple beers. Well, we're gonna head over to Belgium and Germany because I know they. I know they make great beer. Right. Um, I think my. I think. I mean, I'm just an American craft guy. So mm -hmm. I mean, I think the best beer. One of my favorite beers uh, was in Chicago. Uh, Half Acre Brewing uh, Daisy Cutter. It's rated one of the best IPAs. But I mean, I knew about it. But having it in Chicago was mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, Revolution in Chicago is really good. Um, I'm a huge fan of Founders. I can't, I cannot not put their beers down. I think they make some in Michigan. I think they make some of the best beers. Um, I don't know. I'll keep, I'll keep telling you. I mean, I, <laughs> right. I just, I love to try everybody else's beers. That's good there. Um, I'm glad you're a critic too. So, um, in it. I was looking at your website. You say you have some earth-friendly uh, business practices. Mm -hmm. What are some of those? Uh, we give all of our grain to local farmers. Local farmers either use them for uh, uh, cattle feed, like uh, mm -hmm. pigs and chickens, and some some of them have horses uh, and cows. Um, if not, we have one farmer that picks it up, and he actually uses it for composting, mm -hmm. organic composting. And then what he ends up doing, he sells it back to the farm markets around locally. Nice. So we see what we're doing is taking our spent product that we could be making money on, but we don't want to do that. So we have about, we have about three farmers. We we're going to add two more farmers when we move to the new place, but they take the grain they'll, and they will, uh, they'll feed it to their pigs. They butcher them. They bring them back to, you know, actually there's a couple local places open up right now, butcher shops. So I think they're going to jump on board with them because we've made relationships, mm -hmm. um, on our boiler, uh, we have a condensate tank, so it retrieves all that steam, brings it back to water, pumps that water back into the boiler, and then goes back mm -hmm. out to steam. Nice. Um, 
we recapture as much CO2 as possible. Uh, when we're filtering beer, uh, we set up a process of pushing, taking the CO2 from the tank that we're filtering from and regenerating into the tank that we're going into. If we ever have to blow anything out, we usually have a tank that's open that we can blow right into it and, uh, and keep the CO2 from seeping out. Gotcha. Um, as we get bigger, we're going to look at more things um, such as you know solar panels on the roof and things like that. Um, maybe like a wind turbine if the city will allow us. Right. Yeah, so exactly. It's whatever they want. But as much as we can do, I mean, in the new facility, this is somebody else's building, but the new facility we're buying, so a lot of the stuff is going to be low VOC paints and low VOC uh, tiling and stuff like that. A lot of it's just going to be concrete, mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have to put anything foreign that's going to go on the ground and, and may be um, an issue in the future. Um, the new boiler going in is going to be uh, is actually rated like a hundred times better than that boiler, mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to be able to recapture again, but use it more of an efficient way. Um, the chemicals we use uh, right now, we use one company that's actually eco friendly with their chemicals. Uh, there is a couple of chemicals we Do use. The M -price invoice? Hey, yeah, Penny, it should be on the printer, oh. but I got a bunch of stuff on the printer, so it should be the last, the first one down the bottom. Uh, so yeah that's basically what we do right now okay good deal uh and my last question before i get out of here what is some advice that you want to give to me and the class as a whole um i am a huge huge proponent for doing what you want in life there's there's people um friends of mine stuff like that you you grow up and it's Get a good education, um, work your 30 years, right. uh, get your pension, and retire. Right. Um, we're Americans. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, it should be it should be ingrained that you can do anything you want as you put your mind to it. Um, get a good education, but create your own destiny and go after it. I'm a huge fan. The minute you think that you're going to fail... I mean, I'm, now I'm going to pull out like Oprah stuff. But the minute you think you're going to fail, if you push through, there's there's going to be missteps. Mm -hmm. um, believe me, every single day i got to put out a fire or something. Right. Um, there is never... I wake up at 3.30 in the morning, like, did I do this? Is there any money in my... I used to have dreams of, is there money in my bank account still? Right. Right. Um, I remember I had one dream a couple years, the first year, and it was like I would wake up in cold sweats and my bank account said zero. And it's like, where'd all the money go? Mm. You will always, if you're not nervous about something, then you're not going to be successful. All, you always have that little burning desire, that burning nervousness with you. And that's what keeps you driving. Like, we got to do this. We're going to do this. We're going right. to do this. Right. I have to tell myself that every day. I mean, uh, don't don't get discouraged if, 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 if entrepreneurship is your thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, find something you like to do, then the money will follow. Mm. So, I agree. Yeah. Do you know? Do it. Do it well, and Hopefully, be yeah. honest too. That's that's one thing that you know. You ever you always want to cut corners sometimes, but try to be true to yourself. And if you're true to yourself, then everything should work out at the end. So, yeah. so thank you, sir. Yeah, man, no really problem. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. Let thank me know here. I, I know you're in my email, so anything else. And last thing um, that they, the school asks us to do is uh, uh, fill out. Yes, sir. Yeah.